So hello again, everyone. A quick review of the format of what we'll do. I will introduce the candidates, give them a very brief bio background, then I will join them up on stage, where Doug and Guy will take the first half of our program and go back and forth with their questions that are preset on the issues that we have already sort of ranged that Todd has described. The second half truly belongs to you, and I will remind all of you that there are little index cards on each and every table. I invite you to jot down a question. Uh, if you could possibly keep the question um, uh, that would be designed for both candidates, that's helpful, although I understand you may have something specific based on what you hear on the stage. At that point, once it's written up, just hold it up in the air. We will have folks through the course of the forum grab them and, and collate them, if you will, and get them organized so that they can get them up to me, and I'll read them, and we'll try to cover as many as possible. Once again, we have a packed house. It really speaks to New Hampshire's engagement on the issues and, uh, and conversations that matter. So it's great to be here, and without further ado, by alphabetical order, I would first like to introduce Republican Eddie Edwards. This is where I get to talk about him, and he has to sit here and just look at me. Uh, Eddie Edwards is the former chief of police for the town of Southampton. He served as chief of the New Hampshire State Division of Liquor Enforcement, and under his leadership, the division became New Hampshire's first ever statewide law enforcement agency to receive the distinction of Advanced National Law Enforcement Accreditation. A Navy veteran and graduate of the FBI National Academy in Quantico, Virginia, Mr. Edwards spent a career in law enforcement other small businesses. During his time in the public and private sectors, Edwards has been a leading advocate for veterans, criminal justice reform, and early childhood education. Eddie Edwards has two daughters and lives in Dover with his wife and their poodle, Zoe, and English bulldog, Maximus. So thank you very much for joining us. <laughs> also now I'd like to introduce Democratic candidate, Chris Pappas. Raised in Manchester, Chris Pappas is a small business owner and elected official. A proud product of Manchester Public Schools, Chris graduated Harvard in 2002 and returned to New Hampshire to help run his family's business, the Puritan Backroom Restaurant. As co-owner, he manages the restaurant's day-to-day -day business and more than 230 employees. As the fourth generation restaurateur, his role goes far beyond the office and more often than not, he can be found alongside kitchen staff making ice cream and cutting feta cheese or on the dining room floor helping clear the tables and greet customers. Chris was elected as a state representative in 2002, serving two terms, then serving two terms as the treasurer of Hillsborough County. Since 2013, he has served on the New Hampshire Executive Council. So gentlemen, thank you both. It is time now for opening statements where each of you has been given two minutes by a coin flip that was predetermined the order. We will begin opening statements with Mr. Edwards. The floor is yours, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Listen, uh, it's great to be here with you, and I want to thank uh, Sandy Anselm for putting this on and Scott for uh, moderating. And uh, it's great to know that so many of you will be voting, um, and I'm happy to tell you who to vote for. <laughs> so uh, again, uh, I'm, my name is Eddie Edwards, and I'm running for Congress in the 1st Congressional District. And this is a pleasure for me, because I, I, I really believe that we can do better than what we see in Washington right now. I entered this race to run because I'm just like all of you. I'm not a career politician. I'm just someone who was fed up with the way our government was treating us. I was fed up with the lies and misrepresentations and the divisiveness that's in Washington, D.C. I have a career of service to our nation, to our community, and to our families in the state and across the country. And I want to make sure we get back to a place where we're in charge. Not government, we are. Moms and dads in charge of our communities, not government. And I think we get back there by unifying our nation. Right now, our, our, our country is, 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 in, is struggling, struggling with the division of this country. And I think it, it requires men and women who have integrity to run for office, to step forward, to lead in a, in a way that unites our country. There's a lot of difficulty decisions that we have to make, but those will be made when we elect people who are honest, there's some tough challenges ahead of us, but they, they, we're going to be able to overcome those. This is a great nation. We've overcome a lot in the nation, uh, history of our country. And we can do it again. We can do it again. I, I really believe that. And so I'm happy to be running. I'd love to have your support. I'd love to have your vote. <laughs> so so I, I look forward. I look forward to our conversation this morning. And I'm, I'm happy to answer your questions. So thank you for being here. 
Thank you, sir. Mr. Pappas, the floor is yours. Thank you, Scott, and welcome, everyone. Good morning. Thanks to AARP for putting on this forum, to Todd and Doug and uh, the rest of the team. It's a great organization, and it's incredible to see the engagement out there in this election. We had a record turnout in the primary on September 11th, and I think people are paying attention at a rate that they haven't to midterm elections in the past, and that's a healthy sign. I grew up here in Manchester. I run a restaurant business that's been my family for 101 years. I learned just about all of life's lessons from working in that business. I learned that it's not about you, it's not about the bottom line, but it's about how you can have an impact on people that you work with and people that are part of the larger community. And that led me to get interested in looking at my role in the community and getting involved in the citizen-led government that we have here in New Hampshire. And along the way, I've served in our state house and have served three terms as a member of our executive council. Um, I learned early on in the restaurant from my dad, from my grandfather, and others that I worked with about servant leadership, about listening and learning from people, about leading by example and spurring others to follow. And I think that's desperately what's needed in Washington today. We need to restore the values of decency, integrity, and community to Washington, D.C., to a broken system that um, just sort of appears to be a zero-sum game. You know, during my time at the State House, I've learned lessons about how we can work together, and I've worked with governors of both parties on important priorities for the people of my council district, including ensuring that we expand Medicaid to 53,000 people in this state. That was a significant step forward for the entire health care system, and it's the best tool we have to fight the opioid crisis. I also worked in a bipartisan fashion to protect funding for family planning services, including at Planned Parenthood Health Centers worked across the aisle to invest in renewable energy projects and infrastructure projects in the state. And I think we need someone who has the ability to apply some New Hampshire know-how to the situation in Washington. And we need someone who's gonna provide some oversight checks and balances. Because I don't believe that the President's party should have a blank check. We need to make sure that we have people pushing back, insisting on uh, raising the voices of the people of New Hampshire so that we have policies that work for them. Um, and I'm going to be that type of representative who will work across the aisle when need be, but who will stand firm for the people of the state against efforts to privatize Social Security, to voucherize Medicare, um, and to really undermine core programs that are important to working and middle class people in the state. So I really look forward to the discussion here today. I hope to earn your vote over the course of this campaign. Uh, thanks very much for your attendance and your uh, great questions. So we'll move to the panelist moderating question part of our performance here. And I will start with Mr. Doug Dowell, who has a question, and he can direct it first to Mr. Edwards. Morning, sir. First question about prescription drugs. According to the AARP Public Policy Institute, when the retail prices for more than 750 prescription drugs, commonly used by older adults, increased by an average of 6.4%. More than 50 continents higher than the federal inflation rate of 0.1%. Americans continue to pay the highest prescription drug prices in the world. No one should have to choose between buying food and taking the medicine. Do you agree that drug prices are too high? And if so, it's how we work to lower prescription drug prices and reduce these costs. Well, thank you for the question, and absolutely. America is the only country that does not negotiate its drug prices. Uh, I, I think it's um, shameful we haven't addressed this before. We've engaged in economic protectionism, which has uh, increased the, the cost of medicine in our country dramatically. Um, when you look across, the, uh, when you look around the world, we, we have folks who are paying uh, far, far less than American uh, uh, individuals are paying for uh, medical care and cost prescription medication. Absolutely, and, and uh, allow for negotiation around medical uh, prescription drugs, and as well as make sure that we can buy outside the country uh, to reduce costs. I think when we look at the United Kingdom, uh, United Kingdom, uh, just finish this. When you look at the United Kingdom, uh, that are paying half of what we're paying for arthritis uh, medication. Uh, Switzerland is paying uh, a quarter of what we pay for medication. Mr. Pappas, the same question. Do you agree that drug prices are too high? And if so, what would you do? Absolutely. And we have to rein in the drug companies who are setting prices at artificially high rates that make no sense. I think we have to start with price transparency. 
to actually see why costs keep going up and up and why I meet seniors almost every day who are either cutting pills in half or going without life-saving medications that they need. This is a huge driver uh, in our overall healthcare system. And if we don't address this, um, costs are gonna continue to escalate. People are gonna be denied the prescriptions that they need. I think we also have to allow Medicare to be able to negotiate the cost of prescription drugs. Um, we shouldn't have a carve out for the pharmaceutical companies uh, and we've got to change that. Uh, we also should allow the safe importation of drugs from Canada. And I think we need to provide oversight over the drug companies through the Health and Human Services Department to prevent the type of artificial increases that we've seen that hit people in their pocketbooks. We also need to pass comprehensive campaign finance reform and break the linkage between the pharmaceutical industry that seems to have a stranglehold over Congress and the policies that we see being pushed. Doug, do you have a follow up? We'll recognize Doug for a follow-up to Mr. Sure. Edwards. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, there are two parts to this uh, question. The first part is, as we try to control costs in Medicare as a system and for individuals, would you be in favor of authorizing the Secretary of Health and Human Services to be able to use the bargaining power of the 60 million beneficiaries to negotiate lower prices? Is this so-called secretarial negotiation a concept you would support? Why or why not? Oh, absolutely, I would support that. And because this is a solution you see in the free market all the time. We use uh, leverage to drive down costs and negotiate uh, better deals all the time. And so it, it's really a free market solution to this problem. And so I, I would absolutely support uh, the Secretary of Health and Human Services engaging and negotiating and driving down our, our uh, cost of prescription medicine. As I said earlier, we're the only country that does not do this. Mr. Pappas, do you agree? I, I absolutely agree. I think we should allow the secretary to be able to negotiate those costs. And this has a couple of benefits. One, the price that people are paying. But second, there's also long-term savings for the Medicare program. If people are able to get the prescriptions that they need, health outcomes are better, and we can bend the cost curve uh, for the insurance program over time. So I think it's just a win-win, and it doesn't make any sense to give the pharmaceutical industry this carve-out. Doug, a final thought? The second part of this question was answered by the answers from the two candidates. Perfect. All right. Thank you very much. Let's move now over to Guy Chapdelaine, who has a question, and we'll start this time with Mr. Pappas. Thank you. Um, Mr. Pappas, Americans work hard and pay into Social Security with every paycheck. We must keep Social Security strong so current and future generations get the benefits they've earned. What's your position on strengthening Social Security for current and future generations? Social Security is a foundational program, and it has reduced the senior poverty rate by more than half. Um, it is an important program to make sure that people can retire with dignity and with independence. And I think we have to make sure that it's there and strong for today's seniors as well as people who are in the workforce who need to be able to look forward to a secure retirement. You know, workers today are less and less likely to have a pension through their job, through their employer. They need to make sure there's something there that they can depend on. And so that requires us uh, coming together in a bipartisan fashion and strengthening Social Security. We've got to stop these efforts that are seeking to privatize it or to means test benefits. I think those are very dangerous strategies that are going to erode the program over time. And you had Mitch McConnell just yesterday talking about, you know, now that he's passed a one and a half trillion dollar tax cut, the need to go after programs like Social Security and Medicare to find savings to make those tax cuts permanent. This program is not an entitlement in my view. It's an earned benefit that people earn through hard work and we've got to stand up and protect it. Mr. Edwards. Sure, the, so, you can go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, Social Security program obviously is a, uh, a benefit that uh, we've made promises to. We've told seniors that, that that program is going to be there for them. We have to make sure it's, it's there for them. We have to make sure that people who are nearing retirement age, uh, the program is there for them. We have to make sure that people who are paid into the Social Security program, the program is there for them. And we have to do all we can to make sure that happens. Uh, but we can't use uh, divisive tactics to create division in this country. And that's what you're saying here. Any, any, any conversation about how to strengthen the Social Security program and make sure it's there for future generations there, there's this demonization of one side over the other. You just heard uh, my opponent go out there, uh, make some reference towards Mr. McConnell. He's made references towards me that haven't been true. And so I, I, think it, I think at the end of the day, we have to get back to a place where we can have an open conversation. Just like the union leader said, I had the courage to bring this up and talk about it in a way that really will really secure uh, the Social Security uh, program for, for future generations as well. Is a follow-up, Guy? Okay. Yes, uh, well, both of you have mentioned that there are um, there are proposals that have been advanced uh, 
uh, with regards to updating Social Security. Um, which of these proposals, if any, do you favor? And how would you work to update this key program for the well over 200,000 beneficiaries in New Hampshire to prevent a funding cut, which is estimated to, to be about 25% by 2034? Mr. Pappas? Which of the proposals do I support? Yes. Well, you know, I, I look at, uh, you know, the people paying into the system and working hard to make sure that they have a secure retirement. And it doesn't make a lot of sense to me that someone who's a working person or a middle class person pays 100% of their income, yet someone who's a millionaire or a billionaire pays a fraction of their income um, into the Social Security uh, Trust Fund. So I think that's one way to increase the solvency of the program. I do not support means testing benefits because I think that's a dangerous proposal that would uh, make it more of a political target. And I also don't support raising the retirement age because I think that hits working people um, at a much greater rate. And I think we've got to be cognizant of um, those people that work hard their entire lives and the benefits that should be there for them. Thank you. Mr. Edwards. Sure. I, I, I've read the uh, 12 proposals uh, that were presented. And for, for me, I think this is about really fixing the, uh, this issue. You know, election cycle after election cycle, we hear the, the problems and challenges with Social Security. And no one ever comes up with, with a way to address this because when you begin to address this and have conversations, uh, people become concerned. So I want to keep an open mind. I'm going to be someone who goes down to Washington and make sure that, that we have a conversation about how to really address this problem. But, we, but again, we have to make sure that the, the system, the, our promises and obligations are met. And seniors should not be jeopardized. Seniors should not be threatened. And we have to look at a way to really address this problem, not to, get, get, to continue to give lip service to it, but actually address the problem. Thank you, gentlemen. Doug, I believe you have the follow, uh, next question now, and you can direct it to Mr. Edwards. Mr. Edwards, Our, this question is regarding Medicaid. Sure. Right now, Medicaid helps provide seniors access to long-term services and supports, including services they need to stay in their homes where they want to be. According to an AARP public policy study, home-based services are cost-effective compared to providing nursing home services. That is. This not only saves taxpayers money, but it is the right common sense policy. What is your position on strengthening Medicaid's role for the most vulnerable Americans? Well, you're absolutely right. I, you know, I, I think uh, we have to do something to strengthen uh, Medicaid for our most vulnerable ci citizens. And I think the most effective way to do that is to have states really manage the program, not have a one-step solution, one-size-fits-all policy from Washington, D.C. And that's what we've seen in the past. New Hampshire needs are very different than Massachusetts or California or Texas. So we, we're best capable of knowing our vulnerable populations, identifying those populations, and working with those folks here within the state, not having the federal government dictate to us or manage that process. That's best left up to the citizens here in the state. Mr. Pappas. Well, we have seen a transition of the Medicaid program in New Hampshire um, to manage care. Um, and there's concern about long-term care being rolled into that proposal. I've been part of these discussions as a member of the Executive Council. So New Hampshire is able to put its own stamp on what its Medicaid program looks like. And there will be further discussions, and I hope we engage stakeholders about uh, what the program looks like going forward here. We have to protect it at the federal level, though because there's the risk that it's going to be rated to pay for tax cuts to people that don't need it. And I'm going to stand firm against efforts to try to undermine it or turn the program into a block grant that I think would really reduce um, the availability of funds for New Hampshire to be able to fund uh, the needs of seniors and take care of our long-term needs. Um, you know, as someone who worked on expanding health care during Medicaid expansion to 53,000 people, I'm going to be looking for ways to expand the pie to make sure we, that we protect those federal sources of funds uh, for a vital program to our seniors. As a follow-up, gentlemen, um, Medicaid enhancement has been a, a hot topic in New Hampshire for now a number of years. We've gone through at least a couple of budget cycles with it. Generally speaking, and Mr. Edwards, I'll start with you. You can each take a crack at this. How would you rate New Hampshire's efforts in taking care of this population and in, in directing what are limited funds to those who need it most? How are we doing with Medicaid expansion? From, from what I can see, I, I think we're doing a fantastic job in New Hampshire of trying to address this in a New Hampshire way. I, I, I think what, what you saw was a little bit concerning uh, when uh, this first was proposed in 2009, when then uh, Councillor uh, Chris Nunu wanted an opportunity to read the proposal, a 200-page proposal, to read that and to make sure that New Hampshire was making the right decision. And you saw um, at that, point, uh, that, that time uh, Chris Pappas and a number of other folks voted 
to let it pass without reading that. So I, I think we need those checks and balances here at the state level as well. But I, but I think our, our process here in New Hampshire works because we're able to identify those, uh, those vulnerable populations and actually address that program and manage it much better than a one-size-fits-all from Washington, D.C. Thank you. Mr. Pappas? Well, I'm a strong supporter of the program, and I think it's working. It's working at bringing down uncompensated costs at hospitals all across the state. Um, we all pay for that in some way, shape, or form. Um, it also ensures that we encourage uh, folks to see a primary care doctor. And if we've put a focus on wellness, that helps us all save money across the entire system. Um, the fact is, my opponent said he would have voted against Medicaid expansion in 2014 if he was in the legislature. This was one of the most important bipartisan compromises we've seen come forward. Was proud to work with uh, Governor Hassan and Governor Sununu to make sure we implement it in an effective way. Any final thoughts? I, I, I would certainly like to follow up to that. What, what, what I talked about is a free market solution. We've never had a free market health care solution. And the fact of the matter is, is that the, the programs we've seen, particularly under uh, Obamacare, has raided money from Medicare to pay for uh, the ACA. That's one of the biggest challenges. That going back to Social Security, the government has mismanaged our funds, and they continue to raid these, uh, these programs and transfer the costs. And so we, we should get back to a place where we have a free market health care solution. And if you want to talk about competition, I think when we rob the system of competition. So we have hospitals. They have no competition. In any place you see a single hospital, health care cost is about 12% higher in those areas. Mr. Pappas, final word. I, I, would, I would just add that um, you know, I, I'm a strong supporter of uh, the Medicaid expansion law, of protecting Medicare from raids in Congress and efforts to voucherize the program. Um, y you know, you can talk about free market solutions, but the Affordable Care Act was a free market solution that was put forward uh, where people were encouraged to buy private insurance. Thank you. Let's go now to Guy. And Guy, you can direct your question to Mr. Pappas first. Uh, Mr. Pappas, the, uh, the question is, uh, relates to Medicare, and it's a two-part question. Yeah. The first part deals with a macro view, and the second part with a micro view. Um, Medicare provides affordable health care for 260,000 Granite Staters and invests about $2.8 in the New Hampshire economy. Seniors and people with disabilities are depending on Medicare for affordable health care. First question, what would, you, what would you do to make sure that Medicare is there to ensure that Granite Staters can continue to live with dignity and financial security as they age. Also, some have proposed um, a Medicare voucher system, which would dramatically increase health care costs and risk uh, costs and risk for current and future retirees. If elected, would you oppose legislation that would reduce benefits or shift costs onto consumers, such as turning Medicare into a voucher program in which beneficiaries would receive a set amount of money each year? to purchase their health care. Sure, Mr. Pappas. Medicare is a popular program, um, and it has also helped improve health outcomes, reduce poverty among the elderly, and ensure that we look out for one another. I mean, I think at the end of the day, the moral test of our society is how we take care of each other. And Medicare is a program that allows us to look out for seniors. Um, it has a historically better rate than private insurance at holding down costs. And there are many people near retirement age that would like to participate in the Medicare program. I think we do have to stop efforts to voucherize Medicare, as have been proposed by the Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan, and others in the Republican leadership. I would oppose those efforts. I think there are ways that we can strengthen the program, including allowing the negotiation of drug costs, um, going after waste, fraud, and abuse. And I think we'll probably be talking about some of those options a little bit later in your other question. But I will stand firm for Medicare and not allow efforts to voucherize it. Mr. Edwards. Me Medicare, <laughs> Me Medicare is, is a program paid for by seniors. Seniors actually paid in this program nearly 3% of their earnings uh, over their uh, work cycle. So this is not a program uh, that belongs to government. This is a program that belongs to our seniors. And, and, and the thought of bringing people and putting them on to Medicare uh, who haven't paid into this system, I think je further jeopardizes this program. We, we saw that with the prior administration when you took $700 billion from the program. $700 billion of folks who have paid into a system transfers that money. And we saw this with Social Security, now we're seeing it with Medicare. And, and I think until we hold government accountable for its management of our funds and our resources, we're never going to fix this problem. And to try to come up with another solution for it, I think it's inappropriate in telling folks that it's not going to cost anything to bring people onto Medicare who have not paid for it. 
uh, is disingenuous. Thank you. Gal, yeah, you have a follow up? Yes. Um, uh, alluded to the fact that uh, how would we specifically uh, strengthen Medicare, given the tens of thousands of grant staters rely on it, how would you sustain the program uh, by one, reducing fraud, uh, abuse, and to ensure resources are spent wisely, and secondly, enable Medicare to innovate and collaborate with the broader healthcare system to improve quality of care. Mr. Pappas. Yeah, thanks for the question. And I think that's an important and pivotal one. And absolutely, we need to go after waste, fraud, and abuse, but that's a small piece of the pie when you get right down to it. So we've got to focus, I think, on outcomes, on wellness, on primary care. And that's what the Affordable Care Act has let us do in a much more significant way, which has resulted in savings in Medicare over time. So I think if we look at folks in their younger years and make sure that people have access to basic care, that we invest in community health centers, that we ensure that they're covered and that that coverage works for them when they need it, um, we're going to make sure that Medicare is much more efficiently run, that people don't have chronic diseases that are gonna uh, bring up the cost of the program. Mr. Edwards? First of all, I, 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 again, I have to go back to this because I think we have to be very clear about what happened. Medicare, Medicare Advantage, for instance. Medicare Advantage, over $100 billion was taken from that program. That program offered wellness programs, uh, dental care, hearing aids, uh, uh, vision tests. So we see, once again, uh, folks aren't, don't want to be honest about this. At the end of the day, we all want to live in a healthier community, a healthier uh, society. But that can't be managed by government when it's taking resources from people who have actually paid into the system. I want to make sure that we're not having government rob seniors of what they've actually paid for. Anything further? No. Okay, Doug, next question, you can direct it to Mr. Edwards. This question regards caregiving. More than 173,000 Granite Staters care for older parents, spouses, children, adults with disabilities, and other loved ones helping them to live independently in their homes and communities where they want to be. These family caregivers are the backbone of America's care system, yet they continue to face physical, emotional, and financial challenges and deserve better support. If elected, will you, if elected, will you work to support family caregivers? Absolutely, and the reason I would is because I've been a family caregiver. As a, my wife, uh, I cared for my grandfather when I was uh, as young as 16 years old when he had both of his legs amputated. My wife and I care for her mother. So uh, family caregivers are very, very important to our country because it reduces costs. But not only that, uh, that's an emotional burden also you face because you really love this person. And it's, not diff it's difficult at times dealing with, with, with folks who are, are in pain uh, from an emotional standpoint and from a physical standpoint. And so I think we have to do all we can to help uh, families who are, uh, who are addressing uh, caregiving at that level. Also, I, I support the President's initiative, uh, the uh, RAISE Act, which is going to be looking at this, he, having comments from all people all over the country on how the best care uh, for folks in our family when they're in need, whether that's a disabled young person or elderly person, or someone who is just um, needing care in their home. Mr. Pappas. You know, we need to make sure that we support caregivers. And there are a number of organizations in New Hampshire that do a wonderful job at providing supports, uh, allowing them to cope with it, uh, make sure that there's respite care available, um, that they can deal with compassion fatigue if that comes up. This is critically important because, as you mentioned, uh, nearly 200,000 individuals in New Hampshire deal with this with, with a relative. I think we also need to look at paid family leave because I don't believe that someone should have to choose between uh, wages and taking care of themselves or a sick relative. And if we had a policy on the books that would allow individuals to um, take care of their relatives at a time of need and not have to worry about missing out on a paycheck, I think that would allow for uh, better care, it would allow for more people to be able to stay in their homes, um, and it wouldn't um, you know, hit working people in their pocketbooks. Doug Dowell, Guy Chapter Lane, thank you both very much for the moderating questions. I'm gonna call Todd Fahey up with questions to hand deliver to me. I, uh, I see that he's got a pile, so it looks like you, all of you have been active in jotting down some questions. So we'll move over to the audience questions, and we'll do the same thing, gentlemen. I will just um, alternate back and forth with the questions, let each of you have uh, opportunities to go first, and we'll just move through as many of them as we can. And Todd, thank you very much. Thank you. Excellent, okay. So, Mr. Pappas, why don't we start with you. If elected, how will you support programs for New Hampshire if it conflicts with your party's policies? Well, you always have to be willing to stand up to your party. This is a point in our history where it's important that people put 
party, I'm sorry, put country over party. And unfortunately, there aren't too many people in Congress willing to do that and make those tough calls. I think you know, you're know you most effective as a member of Congress when you spend most of your time back in the district, when you stay really connected with folks, you have a good constituent service operation. Those are the hallmarks of a good member, and that's what I would look to do. And I think if you do that, if you're constantly in contact with the people of New Hampshire, you'll continue to realize the frustration that people have with the place. I mean, we need to, do, need to start seeing action on important issues to the people of the state. We need to start putting some wins on the board for the people of New Hampshire. And that involves going against the party hierarchy uh, whenever need be. Mr. Edwards? Well, absolutely. Uh, I, I think if one thing I've made clear in the state of New Hampshire is that I'm willing to stand up anytime something's right. I've done it in my, my life as a, child, as a young man. I've done it in the military. And I've certainly done it as a law enforcement leader in the state. Um, and, and so I, I think it's important. I was one of the, the first candidates to go to all 80 cities and towns in, this, in, the, in the district. I thought that was important to get to every community to talk to voters, meet them. I'm the only person doing town hall meetings. Why? Because I think that's important to hear from people across the political spectrum and open yourself up to folks and be answerable to the people of the state and not hide yourself from them. I will, I will tell you what I will not be. I will not be part of the resistance in this country because I think that adds to the division in this country. Resisting folks and not willing to talk to people you disagree with. Because I've been in the military, I understand what it's like to work with people I disagree with, I agree with. I understand what it's like to work with people I don't like and work with people I do like. And that's what's needed in Washington. Not someone who wants to resist every move and then say political talking points like, I'll work across the aisle, but I don't want to work with this person. That's wrong. We're better than that. As a, as a follow-up, and uh, I want to continue this conversation because there, there's a follow-up that I think allows us to drill deep in, into how. Um, regardless of which of you is elected, you'll be going in one of more than 400 in the, in the U.S. House of Representatives. You'll be a freshman where it, where it matters how long you've been down there. Gridlock, partisanship, yeah. I mean, we've all felt it. We know that this is it's a difficult time in our country. And there are a lot of people working in Washington, working really hard that may not like each other, don't necessarily play well in the sandbox. So how do you break the gridlock? Yeah, it, you know, I have experience doing this. This is not a talking point or a theoretical discussion. I've done it on the Executive Council. I've worked with Governor Maggie Hassan, Governor Chris Sununu, members of both parties to get the job done. And that's what people are looking for out of Washington, D.C. I think that it starts with relationships. It starts by having a conversation with one another, not talking past each other. You know, Washington's become this tug of war. That's not why I'm interested in going down there. I'm interested in serving the state that I love, the community that I grew up in, making sure that we have better outcomes. And I think we can do that by focusing on issues where there should be bipartisan consensus, veterans health care, investing in infrastructure, you know, ensuring that we continue to confront the opioid crisis. If we do that and find partners across the aisle, that'll open the doors for us to be able to work on even more issues together. Mr. Edwards, your thoughts well, on sure. breaking gridlock? Yeah, well, well, breaking gridlock, I think, starts with, with, a, with a common understanding, a common value system, right? And, and so that's what I was taught by my grandmother, a, a place where you have a common shared value system and belief. For me, I'll give you a perfect example. Coming to the state of New Hampshire is very different than the place I grew up. So when I came to the state of New Hampshire, I was very proud of the motto, live free or die. I thought that was fascinating to see that on the license plate, live free or die. That's a value system that we all appreciate as Grand Estaters. Not someone who says that we should, this, our model should go away like the old man in the mountain. That's, that's not the Grand Estate, that's not who we are. We're much better than that. And so you know, I was very disappointed to read that. That's what uh, Chris Pappas thinks of our model. And we're better than this. We have to have a common shared set of values uh, to have common understanding. Next question from the audience. Thank you, sir. I'll start with you, Mr. Edwards. Very simple one. Uh, family medical leave. What do you think about the, uh, uh, the issue, and where do you stand on it? Family medical leave. Yes, sir. I, I, I think right now uh, we have uh, family medical leave. I remember this program came, came into existence uh, where people were, were allowed to take time off and, and go care for a loved one, and their job would be secure. And families have to make those decisions. Those are tough decisions to make. And I, but I think when we get to a place that we're, we're having government force that on businesses, because I'm assuming this question has to do with paid family medical leave, I think when we get to a place where we, we're having government force that on people, I don't think that's fair. I think a strong economy, a strong economy is the best way to, to drive this. And the best example of this, if you look at the economy right now, uh, for the first time, you're seeing part-time workers being offered vacation packages. Uh, retirement packages. Wages are going up. Why? Because the economy is working. 
there's a, a shortage of, of, of labor. So companies have to do the very best they can to attract people by increasing their wages, offering better benefits. So if you let the free market drive this conversation, it will take place. But when you have a government mandate, what you do is shut it down. Mr. Pappas, Family Medical Leave or, or possibly paid Family Medical yeah, Leave? Yeah, it's been 25 years since the Family Medical Leave Act passed. That was a foundational law um, that gave workers protections. And I think we do need a system of paid leave. Uh, we were close to getting one in New Hampshire this past year. There was bipartisan compromise around how to do it. It fell just short. I think that effort is going to be restarted next year and hopefully we get something done. Um, as a local business owner, we provide paid time off to our workers because for the very fact, you don't want people choosing between um, you know, being with their family at a tough time and losing out on work. And I think as a country, we should treat everyone that way. We should have that basic protection uh, for working people in this country so they, that they don't have to make that tough choice. Okay. Next question has to do with the tax. Yeah, just, yeah. You have something to follow. Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, I, I just want to point that out. Chris is absolutely right. He made that choice as a business person. That's right for him. He made that choice as a business person. Another business may not want to make that choice. They may not have the same dedication and loyalty or commitment from their employees that he may garner by doing that. That's a free market solution to this, not a government solution. Final word? I think it's about protecting people, and it's about looking out for one another. And I think as a community, we're stronger when we allow people to be with their loved ones at a really difficult time. Next question has to do with the, with the tax cuts and, and sure. the possible impact. I know we've all been watching the news. A report came out recently that our deficit is, is growing, and I believe that's the background for this, for this uh, question. Um, if the tax cuts are resulting in deficits so large that the federal government must now look to entitlement programs like Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security to help reduce or make up the deficit, if that is the case, do you believe that Americans may not have supported those tax cuts knowing that that might very well be the result? Mr. Edwards? Well, for, first of all, I, I think the tax cuts are producing greater receipts uh, to, the, um, to the general fund. So that, we have to be clear about that. Greater revenues are coming back to the, to the government. Second of all, I, I find it interesting that there are folks who believe that if you get more money back in your pocket, somehow you're the problem. You, you get more money back in your problem, you're the cause of the debt and the deficit. I don't believe that at all. And I certainly don't believe that somehow uh, folks who are paid in Social Security and post folks who are paid in the Medicare are causing a problem either. I think this is a spending problem that we have in Washington, D.C. We have 4, 535 people that make up Congress. We pay for 70 percent of their health care costs, while our health care uh, costs continues to increase. I think those things are wrong, and when you start to look at the mismanagement of resources in this, in this country, that's the problem. We have a spending problem. Mr. Pappas. Well, I don't think it's about congressional benefits. And by the way, I'm not taking the congressional health care until everyone has access to affordable health care in this country. But beyond that, we need fiscal responsibility in Washington, D.C. And it's not fiscally responsible at a time of economic growth to cut taxes for billionaires and big corporations permanently that gives away trillions of our tax dollars over the next 10 years and risks the fiscal stability of our country, our ability to protect those programs that are foundational. So I think that we've got to resist the conversation about going after Social Security and Medicare. You know, we had a debate last week, and my opponent said he wants to start weaning people off of Social Security. I think that's a dangerous position. And we shouldn't be doing it as a way to make tax cuts permanent for people who don't need it. We've got to get back to regular budgeting. You wouldn't run your household like Congress does its budgeting, where they lurch from one crisis to the next. We need pay-as-you-go policies so that they'll pay for something if they have a good idea that they want to pass. Let's get back to basics and build a framework to be able to have some more stability in the future. Um, but the crowd that's in charge right now is not leading us in that direction. I, I, I certainly want to address that. Okay. I sure, I sure, I sure. I certainly want to address that because I, I, I noticed that uh, Chris has finally picked up one of my talking points about not taking benefits. I'm glad to hear you, you come around to that. That's, uh, that's number one. Number two, uh, it, was, it was such a disingenuous uh, statement he just made. Uh, he, he put out a fundraising letter. And this is, this is what I mean by a career politician. Somebody had been on the ballot 18 times. Um, he put out a fundraising letter that said, I wanted to take seniors. I wanted to win, uh, win seniors off Social Security. Never said that. Never said that. I made it very clear. I was talking about future generations of folks who have not entered the workforce. He brought this up yesterday during the debate. He continues to, to perpetuate something that he knows is not true. And I was very disappointed to see Chris do that, because I thought Chris was, Pappas was a different type of person. But he turned out to be just like every other career politician. 
Mr. Pappas. Well, if um, being part of New Hampshire citizen-led government, where you're running for state rep and getting 100 bucks a year makes you a career politician, then we have a state full of career politicians. <laughs> That's not the case. And the fact is, you did say on NHPR last week that we need to start weaning people off of Social Security. And then in a follow-up question, you said uh, future generations. And we have to understand how this program works. Today's workers pay for today's retirees. And we can't just you know, stop people who are working today from paying into the system and expect the benefits to continue to those who are retired who paid into the system when they were working. So we've got to protect the system as it is, look for ways to strengthen it, not undermine it or gamble it on the stock market. Did you want to follow what, up, what, 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 what I meant, what I, what, I meant, what I meant by a career politician is very clear. Someone who, who left college at 22 and came back to the state and engaged in politics have never really dealt with normal people. That's what I meant by a career politician. That's, that, uh, that's num 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 number two, n num number two, Yes, is there a problem? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> so, please continue. So, so n n n number two, when, when it comes to uh, my statement, I made it very, very clear, made it very clear uh, that I was talking about future generations of folks who would be paying into uh, a uh, um, personal savings account within the uh, Social Security system. So it would be there. Chris is absolutely right when it comes to p current workers are paying for retirees. Now, we're down to about three workers for every retiree. Once we get to two workers for every retiree, that's when the program is going to be in trouble. So, because we have an aging workforce. So we have to do something to, to uh, address that. But to do nothing and keep talking about it, it's not gonna so resolve the problem. And he knows that's not, he knows that's what I meant when we had the conversation. But the fact that he actually distorted the truth is what I'm talking about. When he sent out a fundraising email, it actually said, I said, wean seniors off. That's a direct lie. I never said seniors. Okay, Mr. Pappas, final word, and then we'll move on to the well, next I, question. Well, I think we absolutely have to protect the program. And look, you, you know, these sort of negative attacks, uh, you know, I can handle it. I can take a few hits here along the campaign trail. I think we gotta stay focused on what's truly at stake this year. We need checks and balances in Washington, D.C., and there's only one candidate on the stage who's gonna stand up to the Trump administration when they're wrong, and Republicans when they're looking to dismantle those important programs of the social safety net. I'll stand up for them, and I'll work across the aisle when it's in the best interest of the people of this district. We'll go to the next question. I'll direct this one first to you, Mr. Pappas, and then Mr. Edwards. Uh, Senator McConnell has previously stated that he still wishes to repeal the ACA, including the protections for pre-existing conditions. First, do you agree with doing that? And secondly, what would your plan be? I am opposed to repealing the Affordable Care Act. It was a huge step forward, and it includes many patient protections that we cannot allow be stripped away. Um, it prevents insurance companies from being able to discriminate against people because of their age or because they may have a pre-existing condition, which is about half the adult population in New Hampshire. So we have to stop these efforts uh, to repeal the ACA outright uh, that have passed dozens of times through Congress. I'll stand up to it. I think we have to go forward in a bipartisan way to bring down costs. And there's a group in Congress that's focused on this right now. They have legislation that's ready to go that would address um, the cost sharing reductions that the president pulled away that resulted in premium spikes on the marketplace. I think that's a great place to start to um, building on the ACA and truly making it work so that we bring choice and competition and bring down costs. That should be the job number one. Mr. Edwards, your take on the future of the ACA. Well, as I said earlier, we need a free market healthcare solution. The ACA has robbed Medicare of $700 billion, Medicare, I mean, Medicaid uh, advantage of another $100 billion. Uh, so we have to make sure that th that program is secure. And we, make, we have to make sure that we have a free market healthcare driven solution. We've never had that in this country. Right now, you should be able to shop for your health care insurance any way you like. You should be able to buy medicine at a cheaper price outside the country if you like. We should have competition around hospitals. We don't have competition around hospitals. Uh, so we cut off access. We reduce the number of doctors in, uh, that are practicing. We have uh, secured, uh, re restricted the number of places that could provide insurance, particularly in our state. And so that's driven up the cost of health care. And so we come, so the government under Obama, uh, care and many Democrats, came in and said, we'll tell you where to buy insurance, how to buy insurance, what you'll buy, what you will not buy. And we penalize folks for the first time in our country for not buying something the government mandates you buy. I think that's wrong. 
Do, you, do the two of you believe that there's maybe middle ground to be able to take care of the pricing side of the ACA equation to make it more affordable long term while continuing some of the protections that are now built into the system that seem like they'd be very, very hard to roll back? Is there middle ground here or do we have to take one path or another? Is this an absolute? I, there absolutely is middle ground, but the effort to sabotage the ACA for political purposes or to repeal it outright without having a plan to replace it is totally irresponsible, and we've got to shut that down. Um, I will do that as a member of Congress. I'm not sure my opponent will. Um, I think that there is legislation ready to go, as I mentioned, that the Problem Solvers Caucus has helped develop. There, the, there's the Murray-Alexander legislation that was proposed in the Senate. Um, that's a compromise that could help restore these cost sharing reductions, bring some stability to the marketplace. I also think we need a public option for the marketplace so that there's more choice and competition for consumers here in New Hampshire. Thank you. Mr. Edwards? Uh, again, these programs cost. So, so I, I definitely think there's middle ground in terms of making sure that people who have pre-existing conditions are covered. I, I don't think anyone wants to make sure to, uh, to let people out there not be covered who have pre-existing conditions. That's not the issue here. The, the issue here is about freedom of choice. And when government makes steps in, we haven't seen one program, one program where government has decided to put its finger on the scale and greater freedom, lower costs, has emerged. Not one program have we seen lower cost. And in fact, Obamacare made this program much worse, much worse. And, 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 and they keep going back to a single pay healthcare system like uh, my opponent here wants. And they're telling people that it doesn't cost anything. It's misleading. Just like we, we were misled with Obamacare. We're being misled now by folks who are saying that you want a single pay healthcare system, it's not gonna cost you anything. Of course it's gonna cost you a lot. Any follow-up, sir? Well, yes. we, we actually had a primary campaign where I was criticized for not supporting the Medicare for All proposal. I do support a Medicare buy-in for people um, who are near retirement age who would like to be a part of that system, and they'll pay the premium for that. Um, I think it's really important. Look, as, as a business, we provided health care coverage for our workers long before the ACA came along. And I know the experience of health care, pre-Affordable Care Act, and you know, premiums would go up and up, um, sometimes by double digits every year. This is not some you know, rosy world before the Affordable Care Act was in existence. Since it passed, it's given us the opportunity to make sure that patients have some fundamental protections on the book so that insurance companies can't discriminate against them. Um, and I think we've got to look for more ways to bring down costs and bring stability to the marketplace. I think those ideas are out there. If I well, well, that we agree on in terms of pre-existing conditions. What, the, the issue here is about freedom of choice. Th there is no competition in the market. Every other industry has competition, co price comes down. Th this has been economic protectionism for the pharmaceutical industry, the uh, hospitals, uh, across the board. And so we have to get back to a place where insurance companies are open up to competition, hospitals are open up to competitions, and we're negotiating medical uh, prescription drug prices. That begins to bring down this, the system. What you've seen in the, the o Obamacare, so-called affordable health care plan, I know middle class families in this state who are paying between twenty-five dollars and $30,000 a year for health care. That's not affordable. I met two gentlemen when I was on the campaign trail here who have cancer. They're paying $10,000 a month for cancer uh, treatment. That's $120,000 a year. Tell me what's affordable about that. We have to get back to a free market health care solution and finally bring down the cost of health care in this country. Gentlemen, as a follow-up, and, and this might help um, clarify some of these issues yeah. as well. This is separate but somewhat related when we're talking about businesses, free choice, the ACA in the market, but also per prescription drugs and prices. This is a question that basically just says, how do you feel about the pharmacy CVS company purchasing a pharmaceutical company. Does that muddy the water? Does that blur the lines in this kind of a conversation? Does it complicate what it is we're trying to do? Uh, potentially, I think it does. Um, so I'd be concerned about what that looks like going forward. I think um, you know, we've always got to look for ways to make sure that there are checks on the system. Um, that's one of the reasons why I think um, our Health and Human Services Department should be able to police um, increases in uh, pharmaceuticals that just have no uh, basis in, in fact or in the cost of producing it. Um, so I, I'd be concerned about that, would want to hear some more about it. Mr. Edwards? I just want to make sure I understood your yeah, question. Yeah, the, the pharmaceutical, I'm sorry, the pharmacy company, CVS, is moving to purchase a pharmaceutical company, like a drug maker. And I don't know the details, this is the question in front of yeah. me, but would, d does that 
Does that add some concern or, or even confusion in this overall conversation about what we're trying to accomplish? Absolutely. I, I think something like that you have to look, look at. You have to be very cautious uh, about a uh, pharmaceutical company uh, uh, purchasing, being purchased by a pharmacy. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you have to be very careful about that, very cautious about it. The gentleman, so, thank you. So I definitely want to look into that. Thank you both for that. Thank you for your questions. I'm watching the clock and we're moving already to the very close of our hour together. And I want to thank all of you for being here. And gentlemen, thank you for your opportunity to share your thoughts uh, in, in this open forum. By coin flip once again, we'll move to uh, the closing uh, statements. And Mr. Edwards, by the coin flip, you get to go first, sir. Well, thank you. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you today. I've uh, very much appreciated your questions and I've very much appreciated our conversation. Uh, as I said, when I uh, made my opening statements, we have to get back to a place where we believe in family and community. And families and communities are driving the ship, not government. Almost everything you've heard today, two distinct candidates here, almost everything you've heard has been about either the free market or government control. You have to make your mind up. What, what do you want to see happen? And I, I'm hoping that you're, you're looking for Cost to come down. I'm hoping you're looking for a place where you have more control over what happens in your life, not government dictating to you. So at the end of the day, I want you to go out and, and think about what we said here today. And I'm looking to have your support on November 6th. I think it's very important that we get back to a place in this country where families and communities are in charge of our country, not our governments in, in charge of us. So thank you again for the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Mr. Pappas. Thank you. Well, thanks, Scott, and thank you, Eddie, for, for being here. It was a great discussion. L look, if the government does anything right, it does Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid right. And I think we've got to make sure that we work to protect these programs. I'll always stand up for them. I'll always try to be your voice in Washington um, for that and so many other issues that are important to the people of the state. You know, I've been campaigning for about 11 months now, and I've met a lot of people out on the campaign trail. And you hear a lot of heartbreaking stories uh, about the opioid crisis, about people having coverage that just doesn't work for them in terms of health insurance when it comes time for them to need it, about seniors who are dealing with the crippling costs of prescription drugs that just go up and up. These are the voices that I think we need to raise in this campaign. We've got to make sure that we look out for people here in New Hampshire and that we have a voice of someone in Washington who's grounded in the people and places of this state. As someone who grew up here, who runs a business that's been around for over a century, I think I've been on the front lines of uh, you know, being in community life and being in a space where I relate to people and understand what's on people's minds. And to me, this isn't about doing battle for my party. It's about trying to get the job done for the people of the state. We need to make sure that we have a system that is functional in Washington, D.C., where we have checks and balances, uh, where we ensure that middle class families and working people and seniors have a voice, not just the big insurance companies, the drug companies, and those at the top who get tax cuts and all the breaks they want. Uh, that's who I'm going to be speaking up for in Washington, D.C. And I would enjoy to have your support and continue to hear your thoughts over the next few weeks. Thanks so much. Thank you, Chris. So on behalf of Todd Fahey, who I think has a couple of final words, uh, a, a personal note, I've known both Eddie Edwards and Chris Pappas, fortunately in, in my world, for many years. These are both very good men. And I have a great admiration for their willingness to throw their hats into the ring in this particular American political environment we have right now and to step up and step forward and fight for what they believe in. And I deeply appreciate both of your time, your energy and your passion on behalf of the people of New Hampshire. I know opinions vary and policies differ, but these are both good people. And I appreciate you running for office here in the great state of New Hampshire. Thank you for your time and I'll pass it over to Todd for a few final words. Yeah, you stole my thunder, Scott. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> We continue. Thank you first to Scott and to uh, both candidates for appealing to, appearing today. And uh, we continue to talk at length about the fact that politics is broken. No more time to mess around. Let's talk about policy. And you're both doing that. And you came here today to do that. And we told them it was going to be a policy discussion. And they came to talk policy, and they did. And so th for that, we're thankful. And with that, we invite you to join us for lunch. Thank you for coming.